What are you doing? Oh, no, nothing, man. Uh, the heads up, seven up. Why? What are you doing? Checking out these new thermals. Oh. You know, I was trying to figure out how we were going to test those things, and all I could come up with is a uh, fart test. Hey guys, welcome to Gear Tasting. Today I'm going to start off talking about something I'm super excited about getting. This is the Envision Atlas Binoculars uh, from Envision. So we've been walking around the shop all day today like Predator looking through thermal. If you haven't had the chance to look through thermal, it's pretty freaking cool. So what I like about the Envision binocular just right out of the case here, um, literally we've only just spent probably a max of 30 minutes with this thing so far. I'm really looking forward to getting some more time with it. The, the concept behind it is that it takes a, the, you know, the typical monocular thermal, which I'm look, used to looking through, um, and turns it into a binocular. So you've still got the objective that's, you know, a single objective, um, but your ocular is now kind of dual purpose. So you're still seeing the same field of view through it, but it's just a lot easier to look through it versus kind of the, you know, the straight monocular and having to close an eye and things like that. So um, the ways that I've used thermal personally is during hog hunting. So thermal makes a great way to kind of spot the herd moving and then move in closer on night vision and actually uh, do the hunting, uh, so to speak. So um, this is a, it's a fairly lightweight unit. I don't know if it's actually got a, a weight measurement. It doesn't look like it on here, but um, I like that the battery compartment, which is right here, super interesting. So you've got your battery compartment and there's kind of a, a carrier almost for these 123 batteries. So it takes three 123 batteries, you drop the carrier back in, which now I'm confused at the direction. I'm pretty sure it is positive down. Let's find out. Pull battery cartridge, install batteries. You know what? I wonder if it matters. I'm kind of curious, but either way, that's the uh, the battery carrier. It takes three 123s. It's got a you know a lens cover on the ocular there. Um, this says it's a 50 millimeter f 1.2 lens, and try to power this on here. I think I do have the batteries in backwards. So the, the Atlas housing here is rubberized, so it's, it's got a rubberized coating. Basically everything from here back is rubberized, including the, uh, the ocular lenses that you look through. And Everybody wanted to see me change the batteries a couple times, right? All right, so that is kind of the, the housing. It's got a, a strap, a neck strap here that you can wear. Um, the, the rubberized coating here looks pretty cool um, and it, it functions really well. The, uh, there's still airflow coming around your eyes, which is important. Anybody that's looked through binoculars before, you know that if you completely seal your, your eye socket as you're looking through these, you can actually cause fogging in the lenses too. So. Um, I like the way that these are offset so it doesn't really cause that, that fogging and you're still able to see through it pretty well too. So in terms of the actual unit itself, it's fairly straightforward. So you've got four modes in this. Uh, I mentioned the predator mode, which is really called color mode. It's got black hot, white hot, and then it's got the color mode, which I mentioned, and then it's got outline. I think outline is what they call it. Doo -doo -doo -doo. White hot, black hot, color mode, edge detection, not outline. So edge detection is kind of if you've ever looked through a CADI unit, so basically it's the thermal unit that clip, clips onto a PVS-14, the single monocular, it looks very much like that. So it kind of 
thermally outlines the edge of whatever you're looking at. So if it's got a heat signature, it's going to show up with that edge. So it's kind of an interesting way to detect things out in nature at night, obviously. Um, but cycling through the four modes can, can give you different perspectives of different things. So meaning that if I'm not detecting something in white hot, I can switch to black hot to look at it and then bump over to color and then switch to the edge detection too. Um, as a way to, to, to make out shape. So, you know, just th obviously the, the principle behind thermal is that anything that's giving off a heat signature is going to register with the unit. So as you're looking through this, you know, you will see the heat coming off of something. So it's really kind of freaky to look through thermal. It's, uh, it's an interesting experience if you, if you haven't gotten through it. So um, the other things that this does is it does have a zoom level on it. So you can zoom between a 1x, a 2x, and a 4x setting. And obviously those are digital zooms, they're not optical zooms. Um, and then you can enhance the, the color, the contrast enhancement. Um, so you can increase and decrease contrast. Um, it's got a calibration setting, so you can calibrate it first. But the polarity is what they call those cycles. So the black hot, white hot, et cetera. Those are called polarity settings. And then there's menus and navigation and things like that. But you can also take pictures with it, which I think is a pretty cool feature too. Um, as far as exporting them, I'm not sure how to do that yet. Uh, I've got to kind of read more of the manual. There's a USB drive that comes with it uh, that's got more details on the manual. But uh, I'm really looking forward to getting more time with this. And I really want to report back to you guys to tell you how it's been working. Um, the Atlas binocular is not for the faint of heart when it comes to the wallet. Um, it can be kind of a pricey unit, but the benefits of thermal are huge if, if you're somebody that needs it or you're doing something like hunting at night. Uh, it can be a huge game changer too. So check them out. Envision Optics, the Atlas thermal binocular. All right, guys. So the next thing I want to talk about is a book that I've been reading called Wired to Eat. So not really been reading it, more listening to it on audiobook, but I do own a physical copy too. I just didn't have one with me. But I would highly recommend if you're going to check it out, you check out the audiobook. Um, I listen to it on the way to and from work, which is typically when I listen to audiobooks. But I found it a really engaging way to kind of get into the subject matter, which is really a change in the way that you should eat, the way you can eat. It's not really a programmed diet, so to speak. So. Really, I just wrote an article on the site. I will link to it in the description. I'd highly recommend checking it out because I do go through kind of how Kelly and I have been on this, this program now for about 11 weeks, and I'm down like 14 pounds already. So it's a pretty interesting program. Um, as you guys know, I, I do have a pretty good PT routine, but I've recently injured my knee pretty good, I'd say three months ago now, and I've still been recovering from the knee injury. I started getting into playing ice hockey. Uh, I played goalie, so my knee got really screwed up, and I haven't been doing much of anything. Like even weird movements like uh, just tweaking weight around it would screw up my knee. So there's hardly anything I can do right now. I was really getting depressed, you know, that I couldn't work out because that's something I enjoy doing, and I've been doing it for a long time. Um, so I was really optimistic about this program and trying to see how changing the way that I eat would, would affect my weight. And I'm really happy to say it's been tremendous. So I like to say when people ask me about what I've you know, been eating and things like that, I like to say that it's really changed my relationship to food. So I used to get cravings. I used to get all kinds of different issues when it came to food, meaning that not just the cravings, but like, you know, foods would become less satiating, they wouldn't be satiating. There's a bunch of different things that happen uh, when you develop kind of an addiction uh, to food, so to speak. So this book really talks a little bit about the philosophy behind that, um, in addition to giving you this 30-day reset. So I talk about that in the article I wrote. You're basically following, a, I guess, a clean, wholesome way of eating through kind of a modified paleo diet. And when I say that, so it's cutting out things like uh, legumes, which is any kind of beans, it's cutting out dairy, it's cutting out sugar, and it's cutting out wheat, which that's, you know, the staple of the American diet. So it's really kind of hard in, you know, in essence to really think, oh, I'm going to be on this for 30 days. But, you know, Kelly and I have been on this thing for, like I said, about 11 weeks now. And 
we haven't even come off of that initial way of eating for 30 days. So we've just been continuing that. So it's been, you know, what, over 78 days or something, close to 80 days that we've been eating like this. Um, and it's been phenomenal. Energy level is just through the roof. Uh, I can't say enough good things about it, but the idea with a 30-day reset is to get rid of the foods in your system that are causing inflammation, and that inflammation leads to a lot of the chronic diseases that we as Americans are facing today. So by removing the, that inflammation, you kind of allow your body to reset, and then uh, Rob Wolf, the, the author, has a way of suggesting you slowly start adding foods back in, kind of testing your blood glucose to see what's spiking it. And why that's important is that he really describes in the book that foods affect people differently. So he has this big thing about weight not being your fault. And, you know, I look at that as somebody that's, you know, pretty much responsible. I feel responsible for every, you know, thing that I do in life. Uh, I look at that and go, there's no way. What do you mean, you know, you're not responsible for what you eat or you're not responsible for your weight? But he does put it in perspective to say, if you look at the way blood glu glucose affects you, if by eating a certain food, like he gives it, uh, the example of a banana. So in a ban with, by eating a banana, it causes one person's blood glucose to spike. It causes another person's blood glucose to stay normal. So, and then a cookie does the opposite thing. So it's really kind of a, an interesting way to look at food and to look at how things affect you. And again, at the end, you're supposed to kind of slowly introduce foods, test your blood glucose, and see what they're doing to you so you can avoid the things that spike your blood, blood glucose that lead to things like your body not being able to tell you you're full and, and other things like that. So I'd highly recommend checking out the book. It's done a lot for me. Rob's on the plan too here at work. I, I really can't say enough good things about it. I am in no way taking any kind of sponsorship money from Wired to Eat. Uh, my only interaction with Rob Wolf was back in 2008 when I did a CrossFit Level 1 seminar and he was the guest lecturer on the nutrition portion. So I've been a fan of what he's been doing for a long time. I've just never read any of his books or really delved into anything like super paleo like this. Uh, but it's really kind of a, a paleo slash keto a ketosis type program too. So anyway, if you got questions, throw them up in, uh, in the comments and I will try to field them too because I do, I want to be able to share this information with as many people as I can because it really has helped me a lot and, and I don't like the word diet and this is not what this is at all. All right guys, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is something that I took home from Muster this year. We just recently had our Muster alumni get together. Uh, we called it the conclave, so we all kind of sat around, shared some skills, and got some time to hang out and bond together. It was a really cool experience, but one of the things that I picked up as a tip that I wanted to share with you guys is one of the guys from Muster had these pencil caps. So while this may not look like much, I, it was really kind of a light bulb moment when I saw this, uh, because Typically, when I'm doing land navigation and stuff, you know, I've got a map, I've got a compass, and, and other things are kind of working there. But I've never really been happy with the whole pencil situation. The, the best thing that I've found thus far is a right in the rain pencil. This is kind of an adjustable pencil. You can twist this here, and the lead comes out, and you kind of have to untwist it and push it back in. But you can, you know, basically use this as a mechanical pencil, but the, the lead on it is really thick and it, it's not prone to breaking like normal uh, mechanical pencil lead is. But one of the issues that I've found with it, and you can see the 100 mile per hour tape here on the back of my pencil, is that the eraser falls off. So I've got a couple of extra erasers just for that purpose, and I was, you know, having to use them until I figured out, want, hey dummy, why not just freaking put some 100 mile per hour tape on it? But you can see that the the erasure, the erasure, that's a <laughs> band that I like too, <laughs> from way back in the day. Anyway, the, uh, the eraser here is kind of a, a pressure fitting. So this little metal piece here um, just fits into the back of this. And funny enough, that's where the lead is stored too. So when you lose your eraser, all your lead dumps out. And it's, it, I don't know, I don't, I don't feel like it's the best design that it could be. So I've never been completely happy. I do like the thicker the lead on this. So it does. It hasn't broken on me, but there's just something satisfying about you know writing with a, a new uh, sharp pencil. So I like these little golf pencils that we included with all our ITS ETA trauma kits. There we always have a pencil in there for writing on the casualty cards and things. But we have tons of these laying around, so I'd love to be able to carry one of these. But my my gripe is when I put it in my kit, I usually break off the pencil lead. So these pencil caps uh, solve that problem. You just slap one of those on there 
and it doesn't come off and you can protect the lead on the pencil too and you still have a regular eraser and everything so um, I like the the size of these I like being able to uh, write on maps with them and it's nice to have these um, they come in a little pack of four so I just picked these up on Amazon they're pretty cheap um, and they're metal they're obviously made in China but uh, it actually took me a while to deduce what the heck these were called. I did a lot of Googling, Googled myself a few times during the process. I'm kidding. The, uh, uh, but anyway, these are a good option, and I really like these, and hopefully you will too. I, I thought it was kind of, a, again, a light bulb thing that, I don't know, why didn't I think of that? So, uh, but this is typically what I carry when I'm, you know, out in the field or anything. I usually have some type of space pen or right in the rain. Uh, cartridge in there in the pen that's waterproof. Always carry a pencil and then I've always got some type of Sharpie with me too. I like these little mini Sharpies. So I'm always trying to save weight wherever I can. Welcome to Questions Over Coffee. Today the first question comes from Scott T on YouTube who asks, where can you get a good MGRS topo map? So most maps out there, the ones from USGS, all have MGRS topo lines on them and you're, you're basically going to get something that is not this fancy, these are maps that we had done, but um, you can see they've got the grid lines already printed on them. So when you buy most maps nowadays, uh, they are going to have like a UTM grid already overlaid. These are the little yellow lines here. So you can use a protractor and use the MGRS system on a map like this. But we just recently concluded you know, our alumni muster, and I'm kind of hot on what I picked up from, from muster this year because I always learn stuff every year from everybody that comes too. So... It's, it's just as fun for me to, to pick that kind of information up too. But uh, one thing that everybody, or everybody, a couple people brought this year were maps from My Topo, and I didn't even know that was such a cool option. Um, I've heard of My Topo before, but I've never really purchased a map from there, and I'm not really familiar with, uh, with what they had to offer. But I thought it was really neat that not only did... Uh, did they come on waterproof paper when they printed the maps and you can get them for any quad so any seven and a half minute uh, map you can get for you know obviously the different quads that are around but um, if I remember correctly the guys at Muster were saying you can literally just draw a you know the seven and a half minute size like pulling a you know something in Photoshop like pulling a uh, what do you call it uh, I can't even think of the name, but anyway, like you're cropping basically into a seven and a half minute size and you just basically print the map from any location. It just gives you everything you need right there. So when we were creating some maps like what Matt was doing for one year at Muster, we had to combine four different quads into our own seven and a half minute map, which was, you can ask Matt, a very challenging thing to do um, and then get them printed for Muster. So had I have known about the My Topo thing, I love personalized stuff and we were able to customize that with our logo and stuff when we printed them. But had I have known about that, I probably would have done that because it seems like a very, very inexpensive option. You get waterproof paper. Um, they are all printed with uh, MGRS or UTM lines on them so you can navigate with the MGRS system by using a protractor. But the great thing is that there's also an up-to-date declination setting wherever the uh, your uh, your quad comes from. It's got the accurate declination uh, at, up to date. So the one that uh, somebody had at Muster was literally like a week old in the declination adjustment. So that's always a good feature that you need to know at the, the area you're navigating at is what the declination is, whether you dial that declination into a compass or whether you manually calculate that. I hate manual calculating, by the way. Um, I'm not very good at math, as you guys know. So I like to set that in my compass and forget it. But um, those are some things that I think are, are worthy of picking up a, a map on mytopo.com. By the way, if you're interested in the correct way to fold a map, I will put a link to our article on how to properly fold a map in the description of the YouTube video. Okay, last question comes from Jason L. on YouTube. 
Does Brian wear pants or shorts every time he's behind the gear tasting desk or table? Actually, got pants on today. Usually I have shorts. It depends on the weather, though. I think he means pants in general. Like, do you wear them? That's just weird. All right, guys, thanks for watching Gear Tasting. Remember, if you have any questions, use the pound tag Gear Tasting on any social media network, and we will get them answered here on the show. And as always, thank you guys for watching. If you're enjoying what we're doing, please consider supporting us. You can check out us, you can check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash ITS Tactical. If you support us, we've got something to give back to you in return. Thanks again.